the Lord to be revealed to us in a new and a startling way in this 10-week course, these 20 sessions. So Holy Spirit, come and magnify the Son of God to our hearts. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This first session, uh, we're calling it uh, David introducing the man after God's own heart. We're going to take the the verse, the description that God gave of David, the first and the last description that God ever gave of David in the Scripture. It's the same one. It's calling David a man after God's own heart in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. He's called the man after God's own heart, and in Acts 13, Acts 13, verse 22, Paul the Apostle, some thousand years later, because David was approximately a thousand years B.C., a thousand years later, God speaks again and declares over David the same thing that he declared over his life here in 1 Samuel 13. And David was, was about 15 years old when God declared that he was seeking for a man after his own heart, and he'd found him. He was a young 15-year-old shepherd boy in the back hills of Bethlehem. Bethlehem was a town of about 300 people just out at the edge of nowhere, but God had seen the cry and the impulse of his heart for the Lord, and it got the Lord's attention. Now, it's one thing for the Lord to describe David at the beginning of his life, when he's 15 years old. That's a startling, that's an amazing reality already. That's a prophetic declaration that undoubtedly Samuel described to David in detail. I believe that when David was anointed by Samuel in chapter 16, I believe Samuel sat down at that meal at David's house, at the house of Jesse, his father, chapter 16, and said, David, let me tell you how all this began. Let me tell you the night when the Spirit of the Lord first came upon me and told me that he was rejecting Saul as king of Israel and that he had chosen a man. He looks at David as just a young lad and he says, you're the man that God sees and his prophetic insight and understanding of history. And the Lord told me something about you, young man, that you have seeds in your heart that have been planted there by God, that when God trains you and brings them to fullness, there will be a mature, deep love that will become a, a prototype for all of God's people for history. But those seeds of love are already formed and fashioned in you right now. We're going to look at a number of the Psalms where David declares that God is the one that fashions and forms the human heart. I believe that was a very real and tender reality to David, that he was a, a person in whom God drew and wooed him in this kind of way, even in his youth. Anyway, that's one fascinating line of study, that God would declare this over a 15-year-old, but it's another one, a completely different line of thought, that a thousand years later, after all the mistakes have been made, after David's lies and compromise, after his murder of Uriah, his adultery with Bathsheba. At the end of his life, and then, yea, a thousand years after, God speaks again and says, I tell you the truth, he is and he was a man after my own heart. And so it's more profound in some ways that God would say it at the end of the journey than at the beginning of the journey. But I love that, that uh, declaration of God over David because it describes God's editing process. I love God's editing process, that God looks at David, and he says in Acts 13, verse 22, and Acts 13, verse 20, 36, verse 22 and verse 36, he said, he's a man after my own heart, and he fulfilled all of the will of God in his life. And I read the life of David, and I go, he fulfilled all of the will of God? Like, Lord, surely you know the life of David. And the Lord says, through my editing process of grace and redemption, the way that I count a man's life at the end, with the cry to be mine all the way through, though he stumbled and fell, he did all the will of God. Now that's an astounding fact at the end of his life. It's the same kind of thing in Romans chapter 4, verse 20, when it says of Abraham, that Abraham did not waver in his faith. But you read, you, you read the life of Abraham, and you find several substantial waverings. He's in fear before one of the heathen kings, and he lies about his wife. He says, boy, she's beautiful. Who is she? And he goes, she's uh, my sister. Yeah, she's my sister. Do you like her? You can have her. And Sarah looks, you know.
with that kind of look that a woman gives a man and like her sister. And so the king takes her, uh, her away. And at the end of it, of it all, the Lord says in Romans 4.20, Abraham never wavered in his faith. He did that several times. He lied and compromised on several occasions. Well, that's a, a, uh, that's the, uh, the grid of which we're going to look at the life of David. There's several ways to study the life of David. The way that I've usually done it, and I've uh, had the joy of teaching the life of David for some 20 plus years, and I've taught it a number of times straight through. My first time was in 1976, when I was just learning it myself, and I was absolutely thrilled by it as a young 20 year old pastor. And working my way through it, and verse by verse, the way that it was taught to me. Covering all the details, and that's how I did it when we did it the last time in the Grace Training Center class. But this time is a little different. We're going to look at three different elements, three lines of thought. Number one, I want to give some historical continuity so you get a feel for the story. Though we're not going to go into details of many things, because we're going to stay on one plane, one main uh a sphere of truth, the beauty of God's heart, and how it was communicated to a person who was seeking the Lord with all of his heart, even in his weakness and in his immaturity. And so we're going to, I'm going to tell a little bit of the continuity, the historical setting, so you can feel the storyline through David's 70 years that are recorded in First and Second Samuel in the book of Psalms. That's the first thing, just a little bit of that. Secondly, we're going to tell, we're going to pick out each session one or two, uh, uh, key episodes in David's life. We're not going to take all of them and that's going to be difficult because so many of them are so fascinating. Some of the little bunny trails in the story are absolutely fascinating, but that's why you have the book by A.W. Pink, The Life of David. He'll take you on a lot of those bunny trails and you can go to any Christian bookstore you want and buy books on the life of David. Check them out at a seminary library or whatever and I really in, uh, challenge you to uh, to do that because we can only look at one one level of his life, and there's so many other truths and principles that we won't be able to cover. I hope that you have an infectious desire, to become a fanatic to read the life of David for the next 20, 30, 40 years of your life. So the second thing we're going to look at a couple, key, uh, uh, one or two key episodes uh, in each session, and then thirdly we're going to look much more extensively than we ever did in the other in the other times we've gone through it, at the Psalms and how the Psalms uh, refer specifically to the circumstances that David was in. And the particular part of the Psalm isn't, we're not going to look at the whole Psalms, but specifically as it reveals what God looks like to David and then what David looks like to God. That's the angle that we're looking for. What God looks like to David. And it is profound in the book of Psalms. I mean, there are some profound one-liners. I love one of them in Psalm 60, verse 5. David talks about himself being delivered. He says, God, you will deliver your beloved. He calls himself the beloved of the Lord. When he talks about himself in prayer, he instead of saying me, he sometimes would say, your beloved needs help, Lord. He knew how to pluck that particular string on God's heart. And the reason that David could understand what he looked like to God is because David knew a little bit what God looked like. And that to me is one of the profound, uh, 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 privilege, not privileges, but glories of the book of Psalms. Is it reveals things about the beauty and the majesty of God that we find nowhere else in the Bible. It does it in a very, very poignant and powerful and direct way. So we're going to take time to look at the, at the book of Psalms. Okay, there's three different uh, paradigms, three different points, points of view, three different lenses that I want you to be able to look through. Again, I want you to see a little bit of what God looked like to David. Hopefully, when you leave this session, you'll have a, 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 a healthier paradigm, a healthier point of view as to what God looks like through David's heart. Secondly, what David looked like to God. And thirdly, what human circumstances and other people look like to David through this lens. David looked at circumstances so much differently than we do because he understood a little bit about what God looked like and what he looked like to God. So therefore, people and circumstances look different to David. So it's those three things that I want to leave us with. What did God look like 
to David? What did David look like to God? And what did people and circumstances look like to David? In the light of these truths. Let's take just a, a real brief historical overview of, of what's going on in the larger context. If you read the, gene the genealogies of Matthew 1 and Luke 3, you know that Adam was approximately 4,000 years B.C. Adam, 4,000 years B.C. Abraham, Genesis 12, he's 2,000 years B.C. So there's from Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years. Between Abraham and Jesus, right in the middle is King David, 1,000 years. Between Abraham and Jesus, right at the middle point, there's King David, 1,000 years B.C. So now we're at Abraham, 2,000 years B.C. Well, 400 years after Abraham, 400 years after Abraham is Moses. The children of Israel are in Egypt. They're in slavery under the mighty power of the, the Egyptian empire. Moses, a shepherd for 40 years, like David in many ways, is used of the Lord to break the power of the Egyptian empire. It's a very powerful story. We, we know it because we go to children's church, not because we've read the book of Exodus. Honestly, the book of Exodus is one of the most astounding books in the, in the Word of God, of which most adult Christians I know have never really read the book of Exodus. And the reason I care about that book is because the, the prophetic judgments loosed by the servants of God under the anointing and the authority of the Lord are going to be loosed again at the end of the age. And the, and the book of Exodus is a very serious book. Anyway, that's a little bunny trail there. But Moses, 1600 years B.C., then, you know, after Moses is Joshua. So we're approximately five, uh, 1500 B.C., Joshua. Then for about 400 years after Joshua is the period of the judges. So we have Abraham, 2,000 years B.C. 400 years later, at 1600, Moses. Then we have Joshua, the next generation, about 1500 B.C., 400 years of the judges. The nation of Israel was scattered as 12 tribes across the land. They were not, they were unified by faith, but because their faith was a very, very weak and, and blatantly apostate on a number of occasions, their unity was broken. They were at war against one another all the time, and therefore, because the 12 tribes were constantly at war with one another, they would never ever uh, provided a unified formative front against the enemy nations. And so Israel was saying, we need a king to bring us together because we keep be, uh, uh, getting defeated by these uh, neighboring nations. Because we're fighting each other, but if we were unified, so. They begin to cry out for a king. The last two judges, now you know the judges, Samson was a judge, Jephthah was a, a judge, Deborah was a judge. One of the judges that you're familiar with is Eli. And right after Eli, he's the one that raised the young boy that was offered to the Lord, Samuel, when his mother prayed in intercession in her barrenness, Hannah, cried out for a son, and God gave this intercessory woman a prophetic child. His name was Samuel. And Eli was the judge, and then Samuel becomes the judge after him. But in this context, because the nation of Israel is not powerful and unified, if they would have had a vibrant faith, their faith would have unified them and they would have been a powerful military force, but it really never worked for any length of time. So 400 years of the judges, the nation of Israel was really tired of it. So they began to cry out to God because, see, God promised them a king through Moses back four or 500 years earlier. But they got in a hurry because God had already determined that David would be the king. But they got ahead of God and said, we want a king now. That's in 1 Samuel 8. We're jumping right into the story. First Samuel 8, they go, we want a king. We don't want judges. And Samuel took it personal, actually. And the Lord actually communicated to Samuel. He said, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me because Samuel was wounded by the rejection of the nation against him because he had so blamelessly served the Lord and led them in such powerful ways. First Samuel 8, we're, we're, we're getting right into the storyline here. We don't want judges. We want to be a military force. We want to defeat the other nations like they defeat us. And the Lord said, you know, 
It's the Lord that is your military power, not a king. And if you get a king out of the will of God, it's going to be tremendous problems for you. Well, they cried out in 1 Samuel 8 for a king. And then 1 Samuel 9, 10, and 11 shows... how Saul was chosen and how Saul was put into office. It's a fascinating story. It's a, it's a tempting story to want to develop the principles because it's a fantastic story about how God chooses and how God trains and, and how people respond to the sovereign working of God and the whole issue of leadership and government. It's a very, very powerful story, actually. Well, Saul's reign begins in chapter 13, 1 Samuel 13, where we are right here, Samuel commits his first grievous sin before the Lord. There's two grievous sins that Saul, King Saul commits of which the Lord then rejects him from being king. It's two grievous sins. By the way, Saul becomes king when he's 30 and he reigns for, for 40 years till he's 70 years old. And that the reason I, I mention that is because that timeline is really amazing how long God allowed Saul to go on after the Lord rebuked him. Forty years in his reign. But part of that reign of Saul was a judgment on the nation of Israel because they wanted something they would not let go of that was out of the will of God. And the Lord actually gave it to them to break them and discipline them and teach them there was nothing good outside of the will of God. And Saul became a torment to their nation at the end of the day. He was a demonized king that led their, the, the, uh, the nation into all kinds of, of disastrous decisions. Often the Lord will raise up leaders of nations that will discipline the nation, that he gives the very nation the thing they cry out for. And he says, okay, I'll give it to you. Well, in 1 Samuel 13, what happens is it seems like an innocent, an innocent thing when you read it. Because in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 8, what happens is that uh, the prophet Samuel tells Saul, 1 Samuel 10, he goes, Saul, he goes, I'm going to meet you at Gilgal. I want you to wait there for seven days. And it's significant that it's Gilgal, because that was a, a place where some of the historic events and the covenants were established, as, uh, some of them in Israel's history. He goes, you wait there seven days, then I will come and offer a sacrifice as a prophet and a priest. And then after I've worshipped the Lord in the offering of the sacrifice, then you can go to battle with the Lord's favor upon us. First Samuel 13. What happens is that in verse 2, there's 3,000 men of Israel. But in verse 5, there's 30,000 of the Philistines. It's 10 to 1 ratio. 3,000 to 30,000. And Saul's only been king a short amount of time, and he begins to get, uh, to, uh, get worried. Verse 8, the people begin to scatter from Saul. Because of just the 10 to 1 odds. They said, hey, Saul, we know you're our new king. We know we're supposed to win these battles. But 10 to 1, sorry, you're on your own. They begin to scatter. As more and more of the Philistines were gathering. So Samuel, I mean, so King Saul said, well, I waited the seven days like the prophet priest told me to. Because Samuel was a prophet and a priest and a judge. He was the last judge of Israel. Saul's the first king of Israel. David's obviously is the second king of Israel. And Solomon the third. So what happens is that Saul offers the sacrifice. You say, well, so what? No, it doesn't operate that way because the laws of Moses were very, very strict. No king shall ever offer the sacrifice of a priest. And the reason they could not do that, David was one of the exceptions because David was a picture of Jesus. Because to do this was to cross the boundary lines in God's economy that were very important to the Lord because the Lord was establishing types and shadows and these kings couldn't just break them. They were types and shadows of the Messiah who was to come. They couldn't break them at their own convenience. That's why Moses got in trouble when he hit the rock in the wilderness because he violated one of the key types and shadows of the Messiah. And it was very serious to the Lord. So he told the kings, you cannot cross the line and operate like a priest, and the priest you cannot operate as a king. Uzziah, the great king of Israel, he got proud because of his victories. Second Chronicles, he walked in and offered the incense before the Lord, and the Lord struck this mighty king with leprosy. He goes, you cannot cross the line that I have put before you. 
And so it seems like an innocent thing that he offered a sacrifice, but that was a very, very serious sin for him to do. But he did it, verse 8, because the people were scattering. When the enemy gathers and the people scatter, leadership is revealed before the Lord. That's a, a, again, it's a very important principle we can't develop. But when the enemy begins to gather and the people begin to scatter, that's when the measure of a man or a woman's leadership is before the Lord. And he says, they're, they're gathering against me and they're scattering the good ones from me and I violated the word of God. I'm sorry. And, and Samuel said, that's not okay. That's not okay. Again, it's a little more serious than you might grasp if you're just reading this casually the first time. In verse, 14, verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, you've acted foolishly. He said presumptuously that God has honored you by making you king and you would just so, just so uh, uh, casually cross the line for your own ends. He goes, that's not okay. He says, you've not kept the commandment of the Lord, which he commanded you. Now listen to this. He says, from now on, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. You need to study the would-haves of Scripture. The would-haves. Boy, they're powerful. There's a number of them. I, I, one comes to mind when, when David had sinned against the Lord in adultery with Bathsheba and murdering Uriah. In 2 Samuel 12, the prophet Nathan appears to him and he says, David, the Lord would have given you more besides everything he gave you if only you would have asked. But instead you have taken this woman and you've killed this man. I love it. The, Nathan the prophet said the Lord would have given you more, David, all of these days if it would not have been enough. And David, I tell you, David had a would have, not just Saul. We want to purpose all of us in the Lord that we get all of the would haves that God would give us. You look at the life of David and I go, what exactly, what measure and extreme would have you have gone in blessing to David? And the Lord's answer has to be something like at least more than he received up until that time. I would have given him more. Well, he told Saul, you, the Lord would have given you this thing for all your days in a, with the blessing of the Lord, but now your kingdom shall not continue. Right now, Saul's about 55 years old. The interesting thing is his kingdom goes on 15 more years. And we're going to fill in the, the timelines on some of these prophecies. It, it's truly amazing. It's 15 years later. 15 years later, when Saul is finally killed in the battle at Mount Gilboa in 1 Samuel 31. Fifteen years later, the Lord is looking and giving Saul a chance to change his heart. Though the kingdom would not pass on to Jonathan, that was part of what this meant. It didn't just, it didn't mean uh, so much you'll die tomorrow, but your son will not be the heir to the throne. It will leave your family line now. But the blessing of the Lord lifted off of Saul from that day forward. Or from uh, real close to then, actually in chapter 15 is when it makes it very, very clear. He says, your kingdom shall not continue. Isn't that amazing? Fifteen years later, he, he, he dies. You know, I'm getting ahead of myself, and, and I will throughout this story, because this story is so exciting. It's just that, so I'm just going to do little bunny trails, and you just got to make them fit in. But when the prophet Samuel comes to David, it's about a 17-year-old young man and tells him, you will be king of Israel. Did you know he wasn't king of Israel until he was 37? Yeah, he was king of, of uh, Judah. He was king over Hebron over a little bit at age 30. But he wasn't king over all of Israel for 20 more years. So when the prophet of God stands before you, and if it's real, and he says, this and that will happen on the life of David, it was 20 years later before it came to pass. Saul's judgment was 15 years later, the fullness of it, when he died. And I'm convinced he died a premature death. It says in First, Sam in First Chronicles 11 that God killed Samuel. I mean, Saul. God killed him. Not the Philistines at Mount Gilboa. God killed him. The Lord said it's now the time. The amazing thing is that God wanted this demonized king to be the seminary for this young king, David. God killed Saul 
only 15 years later after David was sufficiently trained by a demonized leader. That's an interesting seminary course, isn't it? That God puts you under leadership. Secularly. Relationally. Maybe it's in a, in a family relational dynamic. Maybe it's in an employment one. Maybe it's, it's a governmentally and politically in a nation. But God... trained David very purposefully through a demonized king. And that's how he brought forth the gold of that young man's heart and with that kind of adversity. He says here, The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded, it says in the New King James here, or appointed, the Lord has commanded him, has appointed him to be leader or to be commander over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Very, very powerful, very, very interesting phrase. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord appointed him that he would be the leader. Again, the Lord's mailing list is up to date. You can be out in the hills of a little 300 uh, population little village out of the edge of nowhere, and God fills the impulse of your heart reaching towards Him in love and adoration. Little 15 year old boy, nobody famous had to make sure that he got on the right platform. The Lord orchestrated the, the events of which He led David into. David didn't have to use hint faith, He didn't have to like send out the word. Kind of get everybody, you know, lined up with the right information so that, quote, their faith would work towards who he was. There was no hint faith in David's life. He said, if the Lord has called me, I leave it in the hands of God. It's God's call. It's not my problem. It's the Lord's problem now. So this is the introductory word for the life of David. It's a 15-year-old young man in the backside of the hills of Bethlehem tending sheep. He has no comprehension what's going to happen. And it's going to be another year or two before the events even fully transpire to where Samuel visits him when he's about 17. Now Saul, uh, it's a very uh, perilous word for a prophet to tell a king with this much political power he could have Saul execute, I mean Samuel executed. And Samuel was actually afraid of that in, in chapter 16, verse 1. When he went to anoint David, he says, what if, if the king finds out, he will be very angry. I know his tendencies. He's a jealous, he's, a, he's an angry man. He's a ruthless man. And, and Saul was a murderous man. And it was dangerous business what the prophet Samuel was speaking to the king here. Many prophets have lost their head for much less than this. But it's this introduction into redemptive history of the man in whom there's more Scripture on than any other man in the whole Word of God besides Jesus. There's a reason there's more Scripture on this man than any other man in Scripture. He is the prototype of a weak person who sincerely wants God. Because that's what the human race is made of, made up of. He is the prototype of the weak man or woman who really cares and really wants God. David goes through a diversity of experiences, the transitions are so intense in David's life. The hot and the cold is so extreme. He's in the palace, then he's in a cave, then he's in the palace, then he's in the gutter, then he's in the palace again. He has everybody praising him or everybody trying to murder him. It's like he has no no neutral zone. He has every range of emotion, of intense fear and compromise to absolute adoration and supernatural faith quickened in his heart. He has almost, I don't know that he would have exactly every, but seemingly every single range of emotion of a sincere yet weak believer and every conceivable diversity of circumstance. And that's why the Lord has chosen him. But it's very significant that this is the way that God introduces him. And in Acts 13, 22, this is how God finally describes David at the end of his life. The revelation he gave to Paul the Apostle. This must have uh, been an unusual introduction to King Saul. A man after God's own heart, I'm not. And he says, no, you're not. But God has raised up another man in your place. Again, it takes 15 years before it happens. Turn to 1 Samuel 15. We're, by the way, we're going to come back to this phrase in a minute, a man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 15, 
Verse 28. This is Sam, uh, the King Saul has now sinned his second major time. He utterly exterminated, completely annihilated. And there were, there are a number of reasons why it's not just a casual thing that's going on. The Amalekites were a constant, energized opposition against God and his people through every generation. They were, the Amalekites were the ones that came out to Moses with three million slaves in the desert. Dying of thirst. And they said, could we get some water and pass this way? And the Amalekites said, no. Die in the wilderness, people of God. And the Lord said that he swore an oath in his heart that the Amalekites would not continue throughout every generation. That there would be a time, and it was going to happen at this hour right here, that the prophecies would be fulfilled. Some 600 years later, the Amalekites, this was going to be the end. Prophecy was going to be fulfilled. Samuel undoubtedly knew the prophecies. My guess is that King Saul would have understood it as well because of Samuel. Samuel gave him very clear orders. When you go in, this is the big hour. This is a prophetic hour of destiny for the nation. This is that payback that the Lord, the enmity that is the cup of iniquity that has matured for 600 years has now become full in the justice of God against this nation. When the cup of iniquity becomes full, then the Lord acts and, and terrible things happen in, in national identities. And Saul decided to disobey that prophetic word. He wanted to keep the best of the land. God says the animals, without any exception, they're all slaughtered. And so Samuel, the prophet, comes and the rich and the good looking and the best of the land, where the people and the animals were kept and and the prophet says, what have you done, King Saul? And he says, well, I mean, look, man, there's some good stuff. It's worth a lot of money. He said, you foolish man, what are you? You're rebellious against God. You never, ever quit doing this, do you? The difference between Saul and David was this. See, David sinned more grievously in outward ways, or equally as grievous. Let's put it that way, in outward ways. But David was offended. David was wounded that he offended God. And Samuel and Saul was only repentant because he got caught. David's heart was smote within him, the scripture says. He was wounded because he offended the heart of God. He crossed over the line. And David didn't have to get caught. When David crossed the line, his heart wounded him. But when Saul crossed the line, if nobody caught him, it was business as usual. He was only sorry when he got caught. David was sorry because he had touched the heart of God in a wrong way. Now there's the, and, da, and Saul was called rebellious, and David is immature, but righteous. There's the kind of a man that is only sorrowful when he gets caught, and there's a kind of a man or a woman that's sorrowful because they've crossed the line and they've offended, they've touched the heart of God in a wrong way. And that's why David did, in some ways, more or certainly equally grievous things as Saul did, but David's heart was so different. David wept on his own. He didn't need somebody to tell him he did bad. He already knew what was happening. When Nathan came to him and, and uh, unfolded the plot about Uriah and Bathsheba, David just broke. And the reason Nathan did that wasn't to get David to repent. David had already repented, but he did it to announce judgment on David's line and upon the nation. It was a prophetic declaration of judgment coming on David's family line. Because of it, God says he will forgive you, but there will be consequences. I'm going to root this thing out of Israel's experience, these negative things you've done in the position of king. So here in 1 Samuel 15, the prophet comes in verse 28. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today. He's given it to a neighbor of yours who is a better man than you. Saul, the jealous king, he's given it to a neighbor of mine who's better than me. He says, yes, the Lord's already ordained that it belongs to another man. Again, David's maybe... 16 now. Maybe it's a year later at this time. So these are the two introductory references. <clears throat> a man after God's own heart <clears throat> and a neighbor who is better than you. And the reason I, I emphasize this, God calling him better, he was better because of his heart, not because of his maturity. David was immature but sincere. Saul was rebellious. And Saul 
God said the kingdom was taken from him and given to a better man than him. It's a little <clears throat> profile of the life of David. Number one, David is a picture of Jesus. He's the most prolific picture of Jesus as a type in the Bible. The other one would be Moses. It would be the uh, very prominent picture of Jesus. But David is unquestionably the greatest picture in types and shadows of the Messiah who was to come. David is the one man that operated as prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, all the three. Divine offices merged into David's one uh, calling and ministry. So it's a once, it's a one-time deal. Prophet, priest, and king. Jesus is the only one, the son of David, who is the prophet, the priest, and the king before God forever. David was a priest. He could offer the incense. He was a prophet. That's what it says in Acts chapter 2. Peter on the day of Pentecost talks about the prophet David, the patriarch and prophet King David. And obviously he was a king. He's a picture of Jesus. But he's also a picture of the redeemed. He's the picture of the church. And as, as he's a threefold picture of Jesus, he's a threefold picture of the redeemed as well. Number one. Not in any necessary order. He's the worshiping warrior. He's the warrior. He's the servant of the Lord who does the tasks of the kingdom, who does war against the king's enemies. He's the worship, he's the warrior. He's the warring king, the worshiping warrior. He's the servant of the Lord who stands against the Lord's enemies as the servant of the Lord. He's a warrior, a soldier. Secondly, He's the picture of the royal bride, the kingly bride. He's the picture of the devout, extravagant lover. He's the picture of the one that gazes on beauty, who's lost in desire, who wants all to partake of it in tenderness. He is the clearest picture in the entire Bible of the bride of Christ as a, as a person. There's a number of people that are pictures of the bride. There's no clearer picture than David. As that kingly bride, that warring bride. He's the one that gazes on beauty. The one that's lost in desire. The one consumed with tenderness. The one that understands, Psalm 36, 8, the river of your pleasures, O God. Talking about the heart and the emotion of God's heart. The river of pleasure courses through my being and delights me with great joy. When you put several psalms together, and we're going to look at each one of those. And then the third identity, he's the secure child. David is pictured as lost in the father's, lost in the father's embrace. He's the picture of the one who is completely intent in the embrace of God's tenderness, just happy, just so content in the embrace of the tenderness of God the Father. The three main identities of the redeemed, the servant, the bride, and the sons. Sons of God. Women are sons of God. Men are the bride of Christ. We're all sons of God. We're in the Father's embrace. We're all the bride of Christ and we're all servants. Those are the three primary identities in the Old and New Testament of the redeemed. There are several identities. Those are the prominent ones. Those are the ones that show up in the book of Revelation in the eternal city. We're sons, we're the bride, and we're servants as well. And there's a reason for those three distinct identities. But David is the clearest picture. David is the Old Testament counterpart to John the Apostle in the New Testament. John the Apostle is that thunderous man, the, the son of thunder, the man that called fire down or wanted to call fire down on cities. He was that fisherman that worked through the cold uh, winter nights out in the sea. I mean, throughout the night, he was a strong man, a son of thunder, a fiery man, a very... Uh, man's man in the generic sense. And yet, he was the man that called himself, John 21, verse 20, the man that leaned on the heart of God, the man that, the man that God loved. David and John are counterparts. There's no question whatsoever about that. John, the son of thunder, this fiery man, this tough guy, says, oh, I'm the one God likes. David calls himself in Psalm 60, verse 5, I'm the beloved of the Lord. John says, hey, so am I. I'm the one God likes. John says, I'm the one that leans on his breast. David says, I gaze at his beauty all day long. John says, I'm the one that he tells his secrets to. 
And David would say in some many, many places that the secret of the Lord was given to him too. And I'm presenting it like it was competitive, and I'm sure that it, there's, there's nothing like that. But my point is that there's a counterpart of the two. John 21, verse 20. John describes himself as the one that's loved of God, the one that leans on God, and the one that God tells his secrets to. And that's the same profile that David had before God. Let me give just a, a list here. Just a, I got a, I'll try to give it slow. I don't know that you'll get it. But we're going to cover each one of these throughout the life of David throughout the course. I have a, a list of David's unique skills and then a list of his heart qualities. And then we're going to just look for another moment at this phrase, a, a man after God's own heart. <clears throat> his skills, his unique skills, or the skills that distinguish him, not that others didn't have these isolated skills, but it was the combination of all these skills with all these heart qualities that makes David so different. And, and, and this is not comprehensive. I was just spending today just thumbing through, uh, it, just writing them down, and so it's not a comprehensive list, and undoubtedly I'll add to it as we go, but just thinking of the distinctive skills. He was a fearless warrior. He was a soldier. I mean, he was fearless, but he was more than fearless. He was a skilled soldier. He's a military man. Number one. Number two, he was a victorious king. It's not just that he was a soldier. He was a president. He was the leader of a nation or a prime minister. He was the greatest military leader in Israel's history. I don't mean just as an individual soldier, as a military strategist and a commander of a nation, the greatest one in Israel's history. It's one thing for a man to, to be uh, the head of a nation. It's another thing to be a, a, a great soldier. David was both. Those are very different skills. Another thing, he was one thing that uh, you may not... Uh, know just by a casual reading of his life is that he was a exceptionally wise diplomat. That was mentioned a number of times. He's, he was a statesman, par excellent in the word of God. Jesus said, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Most people that are innocent aren't wise as serpents because they think that being innocent and pure hearted means they never pay attention to wisdom. They, didn't, they never understand the cunning nature of others' hearts. David was wise as a serpent. He was a cunning and skillful diplomat, and yet he had purity of heart at the same time. He put wisdom and purity. He put diplomacy and pure motives together into one heart. And again, most people that are good diplomats have dubious hearts, and people with pure hearts typically write off diplomacy as something that just political people do. But Jesus said you need to be wise and pure, and David was a exceptionally uh, skillful diplomat, a statesman. He brought unity within his own nation, one of the only times in its history, and he brought unity among the nations to him. One of the only leaders in Israel's history that actually unified their nation. Matter of fact, I can't think of another one. Solomon just kind of lived in the, uh, the, uh, the afterglow of David's reign, and after that, there was a civil war, and, the, and it was never healed. And before that, the tribes were always warring against each other in the times of the judges. And in the days of Moses, they were a wreck. And so there's no, no doubt that in the life, in the, in the reign of David, his diplomacy unified his nation and the nations around him. Many of them came to peace with him. His diplomacy is a very key part of David's skill, his uniqueness of skill. He was a skillful writer and composer. And I, and, and I don't mean he just kind of journaled and had a little poetry thing hit him every now and then. He was one of the most skillful writers in all of human history. He was everything that Shakespeare was. I'm talking about in natural gifting, in composition, as a poet, as a philosopher. He's a very, very skilled writer. The book of Psalms, we're kind of used to them. Well, they're in the Bible, we read them every now and then. You look at them from a literary point of view, they are outstanding. They are stunning. In the meaning, and the depths, and the layers of the meaning of what he says. He says, well, the Spirit of the Lord gave to him. Well, the Spirit of the Lord gave him all these things. I'm just showing the favor, the unique uh, gift mix that he had. He was not only a skillful uh, poet, philosopher, writer. He was a very, very skillful musician and singer, which is different than being a writer. Skillful musician, a skillful singer. 
which is so wonderful because through that gift he could bring the beauty of the Lord into a experiential, emotional encounter with the people, probably like none other. Another thing that he was, he was a magnetic, he was a magnetic visionary leader. He was the kind of man that had the ability to inspire hope in the hopeless nation. The nation was hopeless. He put hope into the mighty men of David that were the despondent, the discouraged, the indebted men in the cave with him. He put hope in hopeless men. He gave vision. He made people believe the best about God. He made them believe the best about themselves and the best about the nation. He could bring them into an elevated understanding of the good things that were true about life. Next, he was a tender shepherd. I mean, he was an actually a shepherd. He knew how to tend the flocks out in the fields. And then his just his relational skills, his ability to inspire loyalty and courage and friendship in his inner circle was quite astounding. You know, if you put his his uh, personality tra- traits, you march and uh, you know mapped them all out. I, that's a very rare individual. It's smart and pure, sings and writes, does war and likes sheep, likes people and God. I mean, it's an amazing combination of gift mixes. Most people are one or the other. Let's look at his heart qualities. Well, obviously the thing we love most about David, he's the passionate worshiper, the extravagant lover. That's the thing that touches your heart. That's not the greatest thing about him. In my opinion, that's the second greatest thing about him. But that's the thing that we all like. That's the thing that grabs us. That really, really gets a hold of our heart. This This part of David's life. It was his desire to be God's. He wanted to be God's totally. That's what you love. That's why you're taking this course. David was the kind of man that would die for love and never think a second thought about it. He put his his life on the line to serve God and to serve his nation in God. He would die for love without a second thought. And you read his life, you go, oh, I want to be that way. His relentless refusal to live a common life. When I mean a common life, I don't mean that he was committed to being famous and being making history. That's, David didn't care about that. It's very, very clear. He didn't care about that. A couple of times they wanted to take the kingdom. He said, they didn't have the kingdom. I just want God. He had a relentless refusal to live a common life, meaning he refused to live a passive life, a passive life with God. He refused to. He stumbled. He fell. He sinned. He lied. He compromised. He sinned. He fell again. He stumbled. And he got up and he said, I'm yours. I'm yours. I love you. I love you. I refuse relentlessly to settle in for a common life, regardless how much I confront my own weakness. That's the thing we love about him, isn't it? He was a passionate lover of God. The second thing, which was really, in my opinion, the most important thing, because it's what fueled the thing we, that's most, uh, uh, the thing that most of us like about him is he was a contemplative. He meditated night and day, and that's obviously a little bit exaggerated because of all of his other tasks. But he had the spirit of longing for continual communion and meditation on the Lord. Though just the examination of his life, you know that he couldn't do it practically night and day, but he had the spirit that longed for every waking moment he could find time to meditate, to gaze, delight, get lost in the beauty of the Lord. Day, I mean, some... 145, I mean, there's a number of them where David is absolutely lost. Psalm 63, he goes, oh, I long, I'm lost in desire to connect with you in a deeper way. Not just to love you, to feel you, to delight in who you are, to gaze on you. And he had the spirit that longed at every waking moment when it was practical in his life for it to work. Again, he had many responsibilities. The characteristic that probably sets him apart even more than those two, in my opinion, The characteristic that shines the brightest in his life, said this for 20 years, and I keep this in first place, though I have it third on the list here, because it's not the thing that attracts the majority. The thing that attracts us is his love, but the thing that empowers his love was his revelation, and this is actually a part of it, was his relentless confidence in the mercy of God when he failed. David would fall, I mean, he would sin unbelievably, get back up and say, you like me, God, I know you like me, I know what you're like, and I know you like people who want you. 
And all, where other men would stumble, they would run from God. David would stumble and run right into the heart of God. And he would just, he would just be in a holy way belligerent about it. He would just be, you like me, you like me. I'm the apple of your eye. He says, in Psalm 17, I'm the apple of your eye. Psalm 60, I'm the beloved of the Lord. Psalm 18, I'm the one that you delight in. You love me. You long for me. I'm lovely before you. You think, David, what is the deal? Did you not, did you not read your journal recently? You've sinned more than three of us put together. He says, yeah, but I love him and he loves me. He was just recklessly in confident love with the mercy of God. The next characteristic about him was his confidence in God's sovereignty. God was his source, not Saul. He didn't have to, like, make Saul happy to make sure the will of God happened in his life. He didn't see Saul, I mean, in the early days, as his source. He didn't see the man of power as his source. He says, God is my source, not Saul, not 